All right, good morning. How's everybody? Feels like a long time because I didn't see Monday, right? It actually worked out really well that we had a the virtual day because I had to I had to make my other class on Monday a virtual class because one of my kids had a close contact and had we all had to go get tested, which uh, I'm sure you've all had to do at some point in this last two years. So thankfully it all came back negative, but I'm sure there'll be at least another one. So um, it worked out well that we had our, our virtual day plan uh, for, for Monday. Uh, hopefully all of you had a chance to watch the two library videos that everyone watch them and find them fine. Uh, I think they're really helpful. And so if, if they weren't helpful yet, they definitely will be helpful. Um, as we move forward and get toward um, that second part of the paper. If you're looking at your syllabus, the second part of the paper, so paper part two, it's your outline and sort. And it's due two weeks from today. Okay, so I'm mentioning it now and we'll keep talking about it, but just to kind of put it on your mind. So it's due on Wednesday, 3.16. So um, my point with the library presentation was to try and give you some help finding a source. Uh, so for the second part of the paper, uh, it's toward 40 points, and it's, it's you kind of making some progress toward that final paper. I broke it up into parts to, to purposefully make you work on it a little bit ahead of time. Uh, but with this part, what you're doing is you're giving me kind of like a rough draft or an outline of what your paper will be. Um, it can be bulleted, it can be some of it written, some of it not. Uh, basically, the more you give me, the more feedback I can give you. Um, but I'm looking to see that you're making progress toward that final paper. Uh, but a big part of that is that I need you to find one academic source. And that's what the librarian, Danielle, uh, was presenting on. Every single one of you could use the DSM. Like, that is a very easy source that you all could use. We have it in the library. Make sure you use the DSM-5, though. Don't use uh, an older version of it. Uh, you also could use like a journal article. It could be a book other than a textbook. But 10 points of this 40 points is the source that you're going to use. I want you to have at least one academic source for that final paper. And so I'm, I'm having you choose it now. You're welcome to use more than one source, but you only need one academic source. So Danielle went over that quite a bit, the difference between like academic and non-academic and how to use psych articles and um, how you can find this stuff online, or you can go to the library and, uh, and find, make copies or take pictures of the pages in the DSM. Uh, I don't know if anyone makes copies anymore. We just take a picture. Uh, but uh, you do need one source and then some progress toward that final uh, paper. Maybe you have some ideas about a diagnosis, but you haven't narrowed it in yet. Or you have some scenes that are great examples from your show. Um, and so you want to get those down or um, some ideas about like summary or causes or treatment. I'm just looking to see progress more than the content. It's that you have like you're working on it. Um, and again, it can be bulleted. It can be more of a rough draft. And we'll talk about it more um, and as we get into get a little bit closer. But I just want to put it on your mind since that's fresh up from watching it. And then um, the APA style part uh, from the writing center. Uh, Jasmine, who presented on that, uh, that video will probably be really helpful for you um, when we get to the final paper. The final paper has to be an APA formatting. And she went over some of those basics. And, um, and so that'll stay up online. It'll be posted for you if you need it later. But I hope you, uh, I hope that you found it helpful. Um, I was really grateful that they were willing to record it for me so that I can make it so accessible for all of you. So hopefully that was helpful. Any questions or comments or thoughts or anything about it all? Like had nobody said it wasn't working or anything like that. So hopefully everything is fine. Feeling good? Okay, uh, so again, that's in two weeks. So just be thinking about it, be working on it. And I'll keep reminding you as we get closer and uh, closer and closer. All right, otherwise we'll jump back into um, chapter six, right? So we, we got through this slide of kind of talking about some of the biological explanations for unipolar depression. We talked a lot about major depression or unipolar depression last time. Um, and then what we'll do today is kind of build on this, talk about the treatments from this perspective, and then um, a couple of other perspectives in bipolar disorder. So that's what we'll, we'll get to today. 
So uh, we left off talking about uh, the biological factors play a big role, right? What were the three neurotransmitters? Give me one of the, somebody give me one of the neurotransmitters that played a big role in depression. All right, over here somewhere. Serotonin, perfect. There's two more, what's another one? Yeah, mm -hmm. dopamine and norepinephrine. Okay, so serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. Those are the three big ones, thank you. Uh, so if we believe that depression is caused by something biological, like um, a chemical imbalance, for example, our best course of action is going to be to give somebody a medication, bless you, a drug or a medication that's going to change that imbalance. Right? And antidepressants, just like the name implies, are really helpful for fighting depression, right? Alleviating depression. Now they have a lot of other uses. Um, sometimes antidepressants are used for anxiety as well. Um, they have a kind of a lot of off-label uses, but here we're talking mainly about using them to alleviate depression. And antidepressants fall into four main groups, four categories. And I have them arranged up here from oldest to newest. Um, the MAOIs, the tricyclics or tricyclics, I've heard it both ways. Uh, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and SNRIs or serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So four different groups of medications. And um, I have a little video that introduces these. It's not super exciting, but I do think it's helpful. So I will, um, I'll play it for you and then we'll talk more uh, about them afterward. So let me bring that up here. Uh, we'll talk more about them, but as I said, four different categories. Right, let me turn this back on. So many buttons to push here. Okay. Uh, so when we talk about these four different types, right, and, and give you a little information, they just kind of give you a very short overview of basically what I have here in the slide. All of these work on serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, or some combination of them, or some selection of them as we get a little more specific down at the bottom. Uh, brace yourself. I'm super artistic, really talented. I'm about to draw the worst mural you've ever seen, right? I mean, probably it's not the worst. I think my like seven year old could do worse, but maybe not. I don't know. Because I'm going to draw the Okay, this is the end right from this side. I'll draw a little nucleus and then I get fancy. All right, neurons. Really, all the neurons, the neurons. So, when our neurons communicate with each other, right, they communicate through electrochemical communication, right? Our ions start the process and then our neurotransmitters keep it going. And neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. So, when the message reaches the end of a neuron, like these little terminal buttons at the end, that's the beautiful little dot. Those hold neurotransmitters. So when it hits that point, those neurotransmitters are released into the synapse, and then they're going to be picked up. You can imagine there's another neuron right here. Oh, and it's beautiful. It's too bad you can't see it. <laughs> okay. But these little neurotransmitters, they go into the synapse, they flow across, they're picked up, and they keep the message going. Now, when that process is done, these neurotransmitters are typically reabsorbed back into this neuron in a process called reuptake. Right? So if you're wondering about what is reuptake, that's where that comes from. So these neurotransmitters can be broken down by the body, or they can uh, connect on this side and keep going. But after that communication has taken place, they're typically reabsorbed. Now, some of these medications slow the reabsorption or the reuptake of those neurotransmitters. So it creates more of them. That's kind of the idea behind these medications. So just as a, a little, uh, little bit more information. Now I have them up here from oldest to, to newest or like worst to best, you could kind of think about them that way as well. The top two are really old. They're not really used anymore, right? The MAOIs or the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, as it says in the definition over here, were developed in the 1950s. Right, they're very like kind of um, crude in a way now, like they're not used anymore. They have a lot of side effects. They're older and we've just, we've developed better medications. They're almost never used anymore. And they work in a very indirect way. 
they reduce an enzyme in your body called monoamine oxidase, hence, hence the name. That then increases serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So we decrease one thing to increase three others, affects a lot of different things in your body, so it causes a lot of side effects. Uh, these are old drugs, Nardo, it's like the most common one, probably haven't heard of it, it's not used really anymore. The tricyclics or tricyclics, they skip a step, right? So these ones, only they skip that monoamine oxidase stage, but they increase serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So they're a little bit better, but they're still affecting three different things. They tend to have a lot of side effects. These were like the 1970s, that these were really popular. Uh, Elevil, I think is one of the more common ones here. Again, not something you would typically hear of. They're not very, they're rarely used, if ever. These two though, are the ones that are used a ton, right? Like if you uh, go into a doctor or a psychiatrist and you go on to an antidepressant, Almost always, it's going to be one of these two. SSRIs stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It inhibits the reuptake of serotonin into that neuron, right? And so there's more of it. They work only on serotonin. So it's very specific, very selective, very targeted. And so it tends to have less side effects than some of the older ones, which affect more systems. This one, one is the same. Well, some examples of SRS, SSRIs, Prozac, uh, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro, the common ones, right? The ones you've probably seen maybe on TV um, or heard of, right? They're, they're much more commonly used. These ones, same idea, but it adds norepinephrine, right? So instead of just serotonin, it also affects norepinephrine. Uh, Cymbalta, Effexor, Pristique, some of the newer ones as well. Uh, again, these ones are, are newer, they have less side effects, they tend to be more successful, and they tend to be where a doctor or psychiatrist would start rather than something older. Now, if somebody is unresponsive to these or, or they can't tolerate them, we might try an older one, but it's it's very, very uncommon. So just a, a little bit more about them. Yeah. Either one. Oh, I'm sorry. So um, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Just abbreviated them, DA for, for dopamine. Thank you for asking. How many of you, just by show of hands, know somebody who's taken an antidepressant, whether it's yourself or someone in your life? Okay. A lot of you, okay? I've taken antidepressants. As a teenager, my parents were so, my parents were like pro-medicine for everything. Pro-therapy, pro-medicine. I was like crying and analyzing ink blocks, I'm pretty sure. And like my parents put me on antidepressants as a teenager, completely inappropriately, but that's what the show for another day. Um, but I've been on them before. A lot of you have known people. Any comments or stories or, or thoughts? Any anything about what you've seen or what that's looked like for people in your life? Any any thoughts at all? Like that? Yeah. I mean, all these friends and parents that I use an SSRI in the last three years. Mm -hmm. And I, I literally never thought to put it like and so I think that it's great. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's, and thank you for sharing. Yeah. I know. It tends to be something that people like hesitate to share, but it doesn't need to be And I'm so, like, so important. Yeah. Right. And so I hope anytime you like, I took these as a teenager, like, I think it even more. And I have no embarrassment about that. that these drugs could be game changers for you, know, life changing medications that allow you to function, uh, you know, like like you would typically. I think it really alleviate a lot of depression. There was a, did you have your hand yeah. as well? I was also on SSRI and uh, this took my meds up a lot, but when I was on the specific SSRI, I noticed that. Uh, uh, when I stopped taking them, the side effects that I had were worse than when I was on them. So, like, I didn't really notice any side effects when I was on them, but when I when stopped you know. taking them, like, if I just forgot to take some, my brain would feel like it was, like, getting, like, seizures. Huh. Like, it would, like, shake. It was, like, little sounds. It was just super weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and they can have that kind of withdrawal element um, yeah. to them. And, and I'm glad you brought up side effects because that's a, something I wanted to talk about. These can have 
a lot of side effects. Like I wrote less, but it's very, very common that people experience side effects with these medications. And some people can't tolerate them, right? Maybe the side effects outweigh the benefit of the drug, but it can take a little bit of time. There isn't a way to test how much serotonin or norepinephrine or dopamine you have in your body. We don't have that ability, right? We can test hormone levels, but not neurotransmitter levels. They're not in the blood, right? And so we can't test this. And so it's a lot of trial and error. If you've known somebody who's been on one of these, it can be so frustrating. You go into a doctor for depression, right? Or a psychiatrist. And you say, I need some help. They put you on a medication. It could make you feel worse. Sometimes they make you more depressed. They can make you suicidal when you weren't before or more depressed than you were. They can cause all sorts of like uncomfortable things like stomach aches and nausea. Uh, the list is actually quite extensive and it might not help you, right? So it can take a little bit of trial and error, but when you find the right one and the right dosage, again, it can be so incredibly helpful for people. So it's a little, little bit of a balancing act. Um, it can take a little bit of time to find the right combination or the right dosage or the right, even just the right drug. So maybe a doctor starts here and they try uh, Cymbalta and you don't react well to it, then okay, let's try a different drug from a different category and see if that helps you. And a lot of that trial. Anyway, did you have a? Oh yeah, I, I took for that for a bit and I'm super like control feeling all the time. But at the time, that's like better than, you know, the, the opposite or whatever else you're doing. But, and once they like got it and leveled out, that's what started working. Like a lot of days, there's a lot of frustration. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's so common for the people. For the moment, it's maybe if you're lucky, it works. But yeah. It's really, it's really good. good. And, and frustrating. I mean, if we're honest, right? Like if you're struggling with the depression, the last thing you want to do is add, now you feel uncomfortable physically. Uh, you know, so yeah, it's something that you know, take a little bit of take a little bit of time. The click in the kind of some movement, I get excited about the thing. But uh, I want to play a commercial for you. I just went on Google or I went on YouTube and I typed in um, antidepressant commercial and I grabbed the first one that came up that had like good quality. Uh, it's a Cymbalta commercial and we're required by law to share all side effects, right? So if somebody advertises a drug, they have to tell you the side effects. Now, this has become like an obsession of mine. I'll just share that with you randomly. Whenever I'm watching TV, anytime there's a drug commercial, like I stop whatever I'm doing to listen because it's just, it's fascinating to me to listen to the list of side effects. Like I heard one last night, we were watching a Top Chef. I love Top Chef, anything about food, right? Uh, but I was watching Top Chef and there was a commercial for a drug to quit smoking. And the side effects were like death, seizures, like permanent loss of, of, of like functioning in your hands. I, I mean, it was so ridiculous. Um, and so those are always things that you just, you have to pay attention to. They have to legally list them. It doesn't mean you'll get those side effects. But I found a random um, antidepressant commercial. And just, uh, I just want you to consciously pay attention to it. If you've never have, have never done that before, um, here is just an example of what that might look like. Let me pause that. And not have any of those symptoms, right? That's the ideal that you take, um, you find a drug and it doesn't give you any discomfort in any way. But for some people, they do struggle with those things. And so we have to, we have to list them. Uh, and so what you hope is that the benefits outweigh the drawbacks, right? And that's the goal with these is you can find the right one that helps you with your depression and doesn't have a lot of negative side effects. Now, any drug has side effects, any drug. I can't take NyQuil, right? It, it affects me so intensely that I like sleepwalk and I'm lost. Like when I take NyQuil, just the normal dosage, right? Like the little amount, like my partner will find me wandering the living room at two in the morning. Like it, I cannot take NyQuil. It's, it's kind of funny, but not at the same time. Like I've left the house on NyQuil. So I know not to take it. Like I, I know better. I've learned in my 40 years, like don't take my <laughs> So, I mean, every drug has side effects. So, uh, you know, with anything that you're taking, you have to weigh that. But um, these can definitely be incredibly helpful for somebody struggling with depression and sometimes anxiety. Anxiety can uh, also uh, benefit from some of these as well. But uh, before I move on, are there any other like stories or thoughts or comments or anything about, about these medications? Or keep going, yeah, sorry. Depressants are used to treat anxiety. Mm -hmm. It feels kind of counterintuitive. Like, how does that work? Sure. It seems like it's almost like 
stimulating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, and that's a great like logical um, like conclusion to make, right? So anxiety typically is related to the neurotransmitter GABA, right? Um, GABA plays a big role in anxiety, but there's also elements of serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine has a lot to do with alertness as well. And so sometimes when people are overstimulated, we have to understimulate them in order to help. It's the same premise with ADHD. So someone who has ADHD, we actually give them a stimulant to help them calm down because it's thought that they're almost understimulated. Uh, I know it seems so counterintuitive, but people who have ADHD oftentimes calm down when they drink caffeine, right? It helps them to mellow. Um, and, and sometimes it's almost diagnostic that way. So uh, that's kind of the idea behind it is that sometimes they can have like an atypical use, especially if somebody's struggling with depression and anxiety, then it would be even probably even more helpful. That was a great question. Yeah. Okay, so I have ADHD. And are you telling me if I drank coffee, it would actually make me like more tired? It might. So you could try, have you ever tried that? Have you ever? Um, Okay, so it's not ever everybody's. So everybody, well, just blew your mind. Right? Um, changed your life, maybe, maybe not. So everybody has different brain chemistry. Right? Everybody's body responds to things differently. Like I don't know if any of you have the same experience with Nyquil as I do, but like everybody's different, right? And so my partner has ADHD. Um, my daughter has ADHD. Um, so it's something that like I, I definitely see a lot of in my life. My partner can drink a cup of coffee before bed and go to sleep. If I drink a cup of coffee after like two, I, I'm up all night. Like I just, we are affected differently, but it's very common that children who have ADHD are given like a cup of coffee or like chocolate covered espresso beans are oftentimes used because they're really easy to hide and to eat. And that um, caffeine or stimulant actually has a calming effect. So if you wanted to try it, you could give it a shot and it may or may not work for you. Everybody, again, everybody's different, but caffeine can oftentimes have a very mellowing effect for people who have ADHD. Not always, but it can. Was that a... I was just going to say, I have ADHD and every time I drink coffee, I feel more tired. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, my mother-in-law, I, I, I don't know, I feel like I've bad at that. I my mother-in-law a lot. I'm so sorry. I, I feel like I should apologize to her. I was telling my intro psych class before this that she's cooking for me tonight and I'm terrified. Uh, <laughs> she started making spaghetti at seven in the morning for dinner at five. I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared. Like you don't need what, 12 hours, eight hours? How many hours is that to cook spaghetti? I, anyway, she always tells us like, uh, she's like, oh, you should just give our daughter Emma is the one who struggles with ADHD. She's like, just give Emma some Mountain Dew and she'll be fine. I'm like, no, like Mountain Dew has a lot of sugar in it. So the sugar can actually counteract, uh, you know, the caffeine, but there is some truth to that, right? Like that caffeine or some kind of stimulant can call me it. Ritalin, which is usually given for ADHD is a stimulant, right? And it's thought that it helps by kind of a counteractive mechanism, right? That it's stimulating what might actually be understimulated. And that's what's causing the hyperactivity and distraction. Yeah. 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 So what is the maybe deeper in the really high anxiety that you have? Yeah, that's tricky, right? Uh, Brandon and I didn't super specific. <laughs> so, uh, no, 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 it's a great question, right? And and everybody's gonna be different. So anxiety can be made worse by caffeine for sure. Right? Like if you're an anxious person and you drink caffeine, you can feel like you're racing and you get jittery and it like speeds everything up. And you, it might make it much harder for you. Now, if you also had ADHD, the likely that it might just be neutral and not have much effect seems like the most logical outcome. But uh, you know, so that might be tricky with uh, treatment. Like if they do something like riddle, you can exacerbate the anxiety but help the ADHD. And so that's when you end up in situations where you end up taking more than one drug. So maybe you take riddle for the ADHD and then something like um, Xanax to help with the anxiety when it peaks. So it makes it more complicated, but that happens. People have more than one disorder often, or they can be comorbid as well. Uh, and it makes it tricky for, for treatment. Most likely they would kind of balance each other, 
But it depends on the person. Again, a lot of trauma. I'm glad you asked because it shows how tricky it can be. Oh, so the you have your hand up and so yeah, that's that's nice. Okay. <laughs> Tried it and you could give it a cut. I mean, worst case, you worst case, it makes it worse for a couple hours and you can, you can like curse at me on your breath, right? Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And so, like, I, I mean, it's hard to say, but like, everybody reacts so differently. And when you react in an opposite way to things, sometimes that can be, like I said, diagnostic. Um, so, just interesting uh, little tidbits. Every drug is different and everyone reacts differently to them. And it gets complicated when we have more than one diagnosis, for sure. Any other questions? Those are great questions. Thank you so much for asking and for sharing. That I love it. Thank you. Okay. If drugs don't work, antidepressant drugs. <laughs> I should I should clarify, right? If antidepressant drugs aren't being helpful, uh, we can consider other things. Now, the things on this slide are not to be used lightly. Okay. So, if you went into a doctor and you were like, "I have depression." They wouldn't be like, okay, great, let's do some electroconvulsive therapy. Like, no, it would never happen. These are like last measures in a way. If somebody has severe depression and it has not, uh, they have not shown any responsiveness for medication, we might consider something that's on this slide. Now, even then, it's really only used in like very severe cases where someone's like hospitalized or um, they're so depressed and suicidal that there isn't much else we can do. But electroconvulsive therapy is like the old standby for brain stimulation, right? It's still used. I almost said it's shocking that it's still used. That's either like the best or the worst pun. I don't know. Uh, but it's still used today. It's like a, it's not a one-time treatment. It's something that tends to happen over a course of many weeks. Um, it's usually about 12 to 15 sessions. And the idea behind electroconvulsive therapy is to cause you to have what's called a clonic seizure you lose consciousness for a matter of seconds, and it's thought to activate those brain circuits that we talked about that play a role in depression. Now, it can be very invasive. You're causing someone to have a seizure, right? And so it has side effects like memory loss um, and confusion are very, very common, but it is an outpatient procedure um, that you have to have somebody like drive you to and drive you back. But uh, it's something that's used in cases where people need something more um, and aren't responsive to medication. We've been doing this for a long time. I think the, I read it, I had it in my, you know, it's 1937. I won't ask you that. But 1937 was the first time we tried passing an electrical current through a patient to see how it would help them or not help them. I would hate to be that guinea pig, right? But it was a, it was a man who was suffering from schizophrenia. He hadn't spoken a word in months. He was unresponsive to, um, to any other kind of treatment. And the treatments in the 1930s weren't great. And we could just say that. Uh, but they passed an electrical current of 60 amps, that's a lot, <laughs> through his brain. He sat up, swore at them, and they considered it to be a great success, right? Like he sat up and said, like, what the F are you trying to do to me? Something to that effect. And they were like, oh, it worked. And we've been refining it ever since. Like, it could have gone horribly wrong, but it didn't. Uh, and so before that, we used substances to cause seizures. But that was the first time we used an electrical current. And we haven't really understood how this works until more recently. Now we understand that it activates those brain circuits, causes more activity, which is thought to alleviate depression. But again, it's a very, a very harsh uh, type of treatment. Now, vagus nerve stimulation and deep brain, I should move this down because uh, both of those aren't used very often. Deep brain stimulation is, is more like a testing phase and vagus nerve stimulation is really invasive. They implant a pacemaker right, that sends electrical signals of the vagus nerve on either side of the neck to increase brain activity. Very, very invasive, almost never used. But this one, transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, is gaining a lot of popularity. It's very, very helpful for severe depression, and it doesn't have any kind of invasive element. It's stimulating the brain using magnets, magnets and magnetic coils, um, and so it stimulates Broadman area 25, that little tiny part of the brain, uh, by placing a coil close to the person's head. And it, it's just so much more 
targeted and less invasive. But it's not used a lot because it's super, super expensive. It's very privatized right now. So to have a round of treatments like $10,000, uh, it's super expensive. Versus insurance will sometimes cover ECT or electroconvulsive therapy. But I do think that this is probably the future, right? Because it's been shown to be really helpful. Um, I found a clip of this online. Um, so I'll show it to you. It's, it's a company talking about them providing this service. So keep that in mind as they're giving you statistics of how helpful it is. Um, that they're probably a little inflated. But I think it's a good example of what this looks like. And I have to tell you, when I was looking for a clip of this online, I typed in brain stimulation methods into YouTube. That was dangerous. Um, a lot of people showing how you could do this at home home with magnets, please don't, right? I felt like a parent moment to say like, please don't try this at home with magnets, right? Like it could be bad, I don't know. But I saw some really shocking, alarming things um, when I tried to find a clip of this. But I'll show you what this can look like. It's very, um, very calm and um, non-invasive compared to, to ECT. Let me bring this up, there it is. And again, remember that, um, you know, this is the company presenting it. So it's probably a little on the skewed side. Oops, hold on. It really costs like on upwards of $10,000 or more. So it's really, really expensive, which makes it restricted to not that many people. But I think as it gains more popularity, um, I could see it being more, um, being more used. It's been really effective in helping people with severe unresponsive depression. And you can see that tiny little area that they're talking about is Broadman area 25 that we talked about as part of the brain circuit uh, for depression. So all of these, um, again, they're never first line of defense, but they can be helpful for people who are unresponsive. The other, um, we talked a lot about biological causes of depression. Cognitive causes are also really, really common. Now it could be both, it could be a combination of a bunch of things. In psychology, it's almost always a combination of a bunch of things. Right? Like if you want to be correct in psychology, all you have to say is it's a combination of factors that led to X, you're probably right. right? Uh, but the cognitive model plays a big role. And there's a very um, prominent cognitive therapist named Aaron Beck. Aaron Beck developed something called the BBI. Which stands for Beck Depression inventory. A cognitive therapist, so somebody who only focuses on thinking patterns for the most part, might give their clients who struggle with depression the BDI at the beginning of every session to evaluate how depressed they've been that week or where they're at that week with their depression and their thoughts. He really exclusively, Aaron Beck, studied um, thinking patterns and how they correlate and relate to depression. And he came up with something that he called a cognitive triad. Now you can have this and not have depression, but there is a strong correlation between the two. If people have a negative view of themselves, a negative view of the world and their experiences, and a negative view of the future, then they have this triad. All right, so those three things together make up that triad. They make you more likely to be depressed or maintain depression because they're, they're all together, right? Creating a very negative view of the world and yourself and your future. And that can lead to or exacerbate depression. We talked a lot about how our automatic thoughts that we have can very easily cause or maintain depression, anxiety, pretty much any like um, psychological dysfunction. And so that's a big part of most therapies, looking at the automatic thoughts that you have, challenging them, changing them um, as a way to hopefully make you feel better. And an easy example, of like the cognitive triad. And I imagine you've all experienced this to some degree. If you take a test in a class, let's say you fail it. Hopefully it doesn't happen to any of you, but you fail an exam in a class, right? Very common for people to be upset about that. I would be upset, right? And failing can mean anything, right? Failing could be a B, a C, a D, an F, whatever, however you define failing. Somebody who is depressed takes that one event and turns it into something massive. And that leads to more depression. Right, so you fail an exam and see, I'm not good at, I'm so I'm never gonna pass this class. I'm not good at anything, right? I clearly, I don't get this. I'm not smart enough to take this test. I'm not smart enough to pass this class. There's all negative views of yourself, right? Or I'm not good enough. I'm not like, I'm not smart, whatever. 
And then you broaden it. The teacher probably thinks I'm a moron. The people who sit next to me, they know I'm done. My parents think I'm done. Nobody thinks I can accomplish anything. I'm never going to pass this class. If I can't pass this class, now here's where we start to like snowball. If I can't pass this class, I'm never going to be able to get my degree. And if I can't get my degree, well, then I'm never going to have a job that I would like. And if I don't have a job that I would like, I'm never going to earn a lot of money. And if I don't have money and a job, I mean, who's going to fall in love with me? I'm going to end up dying a lonely From one test, it snowballs. Right? And that happens when people have depression. I mean, they can happen to any of us, right? But most of us rein it back in. So somebody who's depressed, it's like, hey, maybe, I, maybe you failed this test, but was it your fault? Could you have done anything better or was it a bad test? Maybe you're going to fail this class, but that doesn't mean your future is hopeless, right? And so kind of trying to rein that back in and challenge those thoughts um, can really help with depression as well. So the biological step is huge, but the cognitive model also um, captures some elements of what can cause depression too. All right, before I move on to uh, bipolar disorder, any other Comments or questions or thoughts, anything else related to like depression that causes any other stuff? Yeah. How do you mean? It's like, um, mm. what, what is that? Yeah, I mean, it's, so there's a lot of like kind of off loose things that maybe can therapy like this. Another one like using LSD. To help couples like work through problems and therapy. I mean, these are things that are problematic because then they create addiction related issues as well. So that it's super controversial to use a drug to help like relieve something, but then where do we draw the line? And what type of it in? Right. So I mean, we create problems by using that barrier in advance to kind of alter some of the state of mind yeah. to change the way that they think about the world. But then when they're not using the ketamine or they're not using the drug. They go back to the way they're thinking before, and so we can create reliance and dependence on the drugs. So uh, it's it's kind of a slippery thing as well. It's not encouraged, but I mean, there are people who do it. Um, just like the like the reading of LSD to help couples work through issues. I mean, unless they're going to take an LSD all the time, probably not going to help them in the The idea is that the, it causes like a shift change um, in the way that you're thinking about the world. But whether that lasts or not is just kind of something that. All right, um, bipolar disorder. So let's talk about uh, when we add the element of mania to the equilibrium. Okay. So bipolar disorder, and there are two different types, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Bipolar disorder is when people have alternating periods of mania and depression. So they have depressive episodes, and now we're going to add a manic episode. So if we look at mania, or manic episode. In order to have a manic episode, you have to have three or more symptoms. Lasting a week, at least a week. Well, one week, depression was two weeks. Uh, so this is um, typically shorter lasting, but the consequences of a manic episode tend to be a little bit higher traditionally um, than a depressive episode. And we'll talk more about that. But lots of different symptoms. Mania, uh, you can almost equate it to somebody just being super, super up, right? Depression is all the way at the low end. Mania is all the way at the high end of mood. Um, it's kind of like an exaggerated state of talkativeness, distractedness, grandiosity, uh, poor judgment, reckless behaviors. It can present in a lot of different ways, but let's look at some of the symptoms. One of them is an inflated self-esteem or grandiosity. Doesn't sound so bad so far, right? Like you feel better about yourself and you feel like you can accomplish anything. But traditionally, those things aren't grounded in reality. Like they're very, um, like not based in anything um, realistic. It's like unlimited thoughts and schemes and ideas that um, might be somewhat problematic or risky and aren't grounded in any kind of um, situation. But I had a student in my class yesterday who shared, she said, um, she in a manic episode, she met um, somebody else 
fell in love with him and was ready to move and marry him after like one day. Right. And she's like, thank goodness. I like when I faded out of the episode, like that came back into control a little bit, but it's that like kind of poor judgment and planning. I can put that here. tends to be relatively common within a uh, manic episode. Like not thinking clearly, not grounded in reality. Um, there's a decreased need for sleep. Oftentimes people in a manic episode sleep very little or maybe not at all, or it's hard to calm down enough um, to go to sleep. There's an increased um, talking, almost like a pressure to talk. If you, uh, we talked about coffee already, right? Somebody who's had way too much coffee, like talking really, really fast, like a million miles a minute, you can kind of look like that a little bit, but without, you know, the use of a substance. And oftentimes what comes with it is what we call a flight of ideas. Maybe they're kind of all over the place, right? Their ideas are jumping around. They're kind of loosely connected. It's like they're scatterbrained. Right, and everything they're saying, you have a hard time following like their train of thought. Um, very distracted. Uh, very distracted, hard to pay attention. Um, at times, there's a lot of psychomotor agitation. Tapping, moving, fidgeting, right? like, like a lot of movement if it's hard to calm down. Um, and the last thing that we see here, hard, um, see if I can shorten it a little bit. Um, there's an increase in involvement in activities with the high potential for consequences. It's kind of a hallmark of a lot of manic episodes. People go on like shopping sprees and spend money they don't have, or they go out and like have unprotected sex with multiple partners, right? They're like activities that have a high potential for consequences. This can also manifest as violence or anger, right? Um, so you can see it in those ways. There's a lot of poor judgment, poor planning, um, and high involvement in activities or increased involvement in activities with a high potential for consequences. Right? And so when people have a manic episode, this typically lasts about a week, right? And then oftentimes they'll transition back to depression or maybe even normal mood. With bipolar disorder, you have people having like normal mood in between um, episodes. It can go months of having like depressive episodes or normal mood before you have a manic episode. Uh, anyone have people in your life who have bipolar disorder? Any like comments or? Thoughts or anything, you know, people in your life who, who have this, your experience at all? Yeah. You don't even really realize you're in a manic episode until, like, you're not in a manic Okay. Like, it's almost, like, unnerving how careless you are yeah. until you're no longer there. I personally have it, so I can go and spend, like, my entire paycheck's worth of money and then some uh -huh. and not even realize how much I spent yeah. until like I've not it anymore and I don't want to spend any money anymore and I'm like where did all of this come from sure like it's completely just crazy it's like you're not really yourself even though you are yeah and sometimes that awareness doesn't come back until you're out of the episode right like you're like you're mentioning anyone anyone else uh, other thoughts or comments or anything I'll pick on my mom for a minute. I picked on my mother-in-law a lot. So maybe my mom is fine. I don't know. I grew up with a mom who had bipolar disorder. Right? And it was always like, which version of mom are we going to go to? Right. And my brother and I was always like, who are we going to get? Are we going to get the mom that doesn't want to get out of bed and thinks she's like she sleeps all day, no energy? Or are we going to get the mom that's like really, really up, is like cleaning the house, wants to do a million things, and is like super involved in it? And we wouldn't always know, right? Sometimes it can feel like two different people because one is like so up and the other is so down that I mean it can just feel like you're dealing with two different people now um 
this obviously exists on a spectrum, and we'll talk about two different types. But some people who have manic episodes don't get themselves into trouble. It's just like an agitated upstate. Other people can get themselves into quite a bit of trouble during these episodes, um, and it can be really, really problematic. So it's kind of a whole range. The very severe version of this, people can even hallucinate. But that's not, uh, it's not super calm. Uh, I do have an example of this. There's lots of shows and movies that feature characters with bipolar disorder, sometimes uh, really incorrectly, uh, to be fair. And this isn't like somebody who is really up and then crashes. Like if you ever had the laugh cries, you know, where you laugh so hard that you start crying. That's not bipolar disorder. It might look like it on the surface, but it's not. This is something that's much longer lasting. Um, and typically we portray it in the media as being very quick, uh, but people cycle through these in a week, right? It's not minutes, it's, it's, it's like a, it's a longer period of time. But if you've ever seen the movie um, Silver Linings Playbook, that's a, there's a great example in there. That movie actually has a lot of characters <laughs> With mental illness is a pretty good movie to watch related to in a lot of trouble for his like violent behavior during manic episodes which which can happen it's not the most common uh but you could still view that as like a behavior with high um, chances of painful consequences uh getting into fights or provoking fights right he goes to jail for it um so you know you see a lot of that it doesn't have to be that intense or severe but that's one way that it might um, manifest it's just a lot of poor judgment very up, very grandiose, um, and then, you know, not sleeping in some of those other elements as well. And we have two different types of bipolar disorder. Oops. Didn't want to move here. Hold on. It's frozen. There we go. Two different types of bipolar disorder um, that we can end up with, bipolar one and bipolar two. Bipolar one is the more severe. Someone who has bipolar one has full-blown manic episodes and full major depressive episodes, sometimes with normal mood in between. All right, so somebody who has bipolar one has the intense highs and the intense lows, it's the more severe. Bipolar two has something called hypomania. I have it up there, but I'll put it here as well. Hypomania. Hypomania is like a mania light, mild mania. And hypomania can actually be very productive if people harness that energy well. A lot of like um, artists, musicians, painters, uh, very famous people have struggled with bipolar disorder and are able to use some of that energy and that emotion and that um, struggle, right, to create things that are beautiful from it. But typically that's not someone with bipolar one, it's more likely to be bipolar two. Hypomania, you sleep less, you know, you have some grandiosity and inflated self-esteem, but it's not as reckless or uh, as high of potential of consequences as full-blown mania. So this is definitely the less severe of the two. Um, bipolar one used to be called manic depression because you have manic and depressive episodes. But then we added, um, changed the name and added this to, to reflect that some people have less intense on the mania. There's also one called cyclothymic disorder, just like there was a mild form of depression where people had it for two years, but it was less intense. Cyclothymic disorder is somebody who has like hypomania and mild depression for two years or more, right? So it's somebody who has like, if a bipolar looked like this, right, cyclothymic might look a little more like that, you know, but like it's a little more in the middle, right? It's not as severe, but they're still having these fluctuations in mood, very often missed, just like the other one was, uh, because it could just be mistaken for personality, right? That you have the ups and ups and downs that are longer lasting. So two different types, bipolar one, bipolar two, and then uh, kind of one other pattern that can progress or, or manifest in cyclothymic disorder. Last, uh, last couple of things, some causes and treatments of bipolar disorder. Shouldn't be surprising, but a lot of them are the same as depression, right? Depression is part of this, so uh, it makes sense there'd be some overlap. Same neurotransmitters, much more so norepinephrine and serotonin, but still dopamine. And But now we have like either low activity or high activity. So we can have too much or not enough, uh, which can contribute to a manic or depressive state. And we'll talk about some treatments in a, in a moment. But we also add an interesting one, ions. We can go back to my beautiful, 
Um, so we have the chemical piece right, the little narrow channel here. So the first part of how neurons communicate has to do with ions. Small electrically charged particles that are inside and outside of the neurons. So we can have, they can be positive or negative, right? And they're on both sides. But these ions, when they shift, right, cause an electrical change in that neuron and cause a fire. Now it's thought that some uh, one of the contributors to the bipolar disorder has to do with the ions, right? That maybe they fire too easily or too stubbornly. And that can contribute to manic and depressive states. And this comes back when we get to one of the treatments uh, that directly affects like ion activity in the body. So it's a kind of a different take, right? But it's um, adding to what we saw with uh, depression. A little bit more related to mania, but still um, another theory. And then a genetic element is definitely there, just like with depression. And we see some interesting correlations with brain structures, but we don't know what it means. Right, we see some changes in like the cerebellum and basal ganglia in people who have depression and bipolar, but it's hard to know if the bipolar caused the changes or the changes caused the bipolar. But that we don't know. Um, so there's a lot of like biological things. This is thought to be much more biological. Depression is typically a, a combination of things. Mania is thought to be much more biologically driven um, than than depression is. So. Again, with, with all of these uh, ideas of what causes it, we're gonna tackle it from a biological standpoint. And so we use drugs that are called mood stabilizers, right? So mood stabilizers do exactly that. They attempt to stabilize mood. They bring the, or I have to think about this. They bring the highs down and the lows up right, into the middle. And right? so we're trying to level out somebody's mood. And, Mood stabilizers are more effective with mania. So it might be that someone takes a mood stabilizer and an antidepressant to help with the depressive side. But the most common mood stabilizing drug is a drug named lithium. Now lithium, if you've taken a science class, lithium shows up on the periodic table. It's a naturally occurring mineral salt. Mineral salts come back to this. Of ions, one of the positive ions is sodium. And so it's thought that lithium actually affects the firing of the neurons in a different way, which is why it's helpful for bipolar disorder, right? Because it is a naturally occurring mineral salt that can have some effect on that process. It's a very dangerous drug, though. If people have too much of it in their system, they can have seizures and tremors. They develop like Parkinsonian like symptoms. So it's very common if you're on lithium that you have to have blood tests weekly um, to monitor how much of it is in your blood, right? Because if it gets too high, it can actually cause quite a few problems, some of them being even long, long term. Yeah? No, uh, Parkinsonian symptoms are shaking, um, like clicking, clicking, so we have symptoms that look a lot like, um, like, 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 affects this part of the process. Um, but again, it can have a lot, of, um, a lot of side effects. There are other ones, but lithium by far is the most commonly used mood stabilizing drug. Therapy, obviously we can use therapy and medication together, tends to be more successful when we combine the two. Uh, but oftentimes people who have severe bipolar disorder need medication. Now you can learn to live with almost any disorder. You can learn to manage it um, and make things better on your own. But having a therapy combined with medication tends to be the most successful. Um, and so oftentimes what we see is that someone will go to a therapist and a doctor or a psychiatrist and have them working together to teach you better ways of dealing with it while also tackling it from a biological um, like point of view, biological standpoint. And um, I have a video, uh, but I feel like it'll take us too close. We won't have time to talk about it. So maybe I'll start with it next time. But there's a lot of songs that have been written about lithium. It's a really like interesting drug, um, as I mentioned a moment ago. So maybe what I'll do, um, I'll start with that next time rather than uh, rather than push us right up all the way to the end of the class. So what we'll do next class is we'll, we'll kind of wrap up our thoughts here. Um, and then we will move on to eating disorders, which is chapter nine. So we're going a little bit out of order. You're supposed to have a guest speaker soon. 
um, related to um, suicidality in chapter seven, but they're taking a long time to uh, to get back to me. So I'm just going to keep going with chapter nine and hopefully they'll, hopefully they'll come soon. And if, if they can come on Monday, we'll switch gears. But um, otherwise, we'll move on to chapter nine after this. And the slides are obviously already up and everything. But um, yeah, we'll pick up here when I see you next. I hope you have a, another wonderful weekend. It's so hot, but it's going to rain on Friday. I'm excited for that. But all right. anyway, have a wonderful weekend. Make sure you sign in before you leave as well. Thank mm -hmm. you.